Want to speak real English from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at EnglishClass101.com. Yeah, vamos a la playa. Now we're going to the beach. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Top Words. My name is Alicia, and today we're going to be talking about 20 travel phrases that you should know. So let's go. Do you have any recommendations? The first phrase is, do you have any recommendations? This is great to use when you get to a restaurant where you don't know what the food is, you don't know anything about the local cuisine, or you're just feeling a little bit adventurous. You can ask the waitstaff, do you have any recommendations? How much is this? How much is this? This is useful when you're out shopping or when you're in a restaurant and the price is not clearly marked or something is not clear to you. So you can ask, how much is this? Usually when you point to something, I would recommend like pointing to the menu or pointing to an item. How much is this? I'd like this. You can point to something and say, I'd like this. Uh, if you want to say, I'd like uh, one, for example, I don't know, you're getting beer. I'd like one of these. If, however, you're in a situation where you can't point, you can say, I'd like 10 of the blah, blah, blah. I'd like 10 of the blue t-shirts, please. Can I try this on? Is useful when you're shopping for clothes. So you find something that you'd like to try, just ask the staff, can I try this on? You can just say, I want to try this on, if you like. Do you speak English? You might get asked this phrase. So you should say, if you're watching this video, you should probably say yes, or you can say yes a little if you're not feeling very confident. If you're watching this video and you're understanding this part and you say no, then uh, things, that's a little strange. <laughs> so, I have a reservation. Usually the staff will greet you and you can say, I have a reservation. Hello, I have a reservation. It's at seven o'clock. The name is Alicia. Usually we say the name is, or it's under, meaning the reservation is under my name, or um, it's for name, or uh, it's in name. Water, please. Depending on which country you're from, water may or may not automatically be brought to your table when you're at a restaurant. If you would like more water, however, you can say, water, please. To make it a little more polite, I would like wave at the wait staff and say, could I please have some more water? Do you take credit cards? Do you take credit cards? In case you're not sure if the shop that you're in will accept credit cards or debit cards, you can ask them, do you take credit cards? So it doesn't mean, do you take, meaning, are you going to take my card? But this take means, do you accept credit cards? This isn't what I ordered. So if you're at a restaurant, you order steak and you get lobster instead. You can look at it and go, ah, oh, this isn't what I ordered. Be careful though. Say this politely. If you look at the wait staff and you say, this isn't what I ordered, they're gonna be like, I don't know, just be a nice customer. Excuse me, but I don't think this is what I ordered or this isn't what I ordered. Can you please check? Could we have the menu, please? If for some reason you don't receive a menu when you come to the table, you can, again, just wave at a, a member of the staff and say, could we have the menu, please? Could you give me a discount? Could you give me a discount means uh, I would like a cheaper price, essentially. So it depends on which country you're in. If haggling or bargaining, meaning uh, talking to the seller to try to reduce the price. My family didn't bargain, we didn't haggle, so I don't haggle. It depends on you and your culture, but uh, just, yeah, just be, be aware of the culture that you're in and the place that you're in before you ask this question. Do you have any vegetarian dishes? Ah, this is useful. Some people uh, have specific eating requirements or eating needs, maybe food allergies, for example. You can replace vegetarian with the specific dietary requirement that you have. Do you have any vegan dishes? Do you have any gluten-free dishes? Do you have any low-fat dishes? Do you have any low-carb dishes? Do you have any fish-free dishes? Do you have any... Could you take a picture of me, please? If you are in a location where you would like to take a picture, but you don't want to do a selfie or you don't have a selfie stick or whatever, you want someone else to take a picture of you, a stranger that you don't know, you can ask them, could you take a picture of me, please? Or excuse me, would you mind taking a picture of me, please? I'm allergic to blah, blah, blah. If you have a food allergy or even uh, an allergy to a medicine, this is the phrase you can use to explain that. I'm allergic to wheat or I can't eat wheat, for example. Is the Wi-Fi free? Meaning, can I use the Wi-Fi free of charge? Keep in mind, some places have a, a, a password that you have to ask the staff for. 
so you can say, is the Wi-Fi free? If they say yes, you can then follow that up with, can I have the password? I'd like to have a non-smoking seat, please. So when you go to a restaurant, you have an option between smoking and non-smoking sections. The staff will say smoking or non-smoking. You can say, I'd like to have a non-smoking seat, please. Quite honestly, though, the most natural response is just to say non-smoking. <laughs> Could I get a map? Maybe it's uh, a map of the subway system for the city that you're in, or maybe it's a map of the area around your hotel. You could say, could I have a map as well? Could I have the check? You're finished at your cafe, you're finished at the restaurant, and it's time to leave, it's time to pay. So you say to the waitstaff, excuse me, could I have the check? Another more common expression perhaps is, excuse me, check please. You might also hear bill. Excuse me, can I have the bill? Where is the bathroom? Very important question. If you're traveling in America, we don't really use the word toilet or washroom very much. We use bathroom or restroom to talk about um, toilet facilities. Excuse me, can you tell me where the bathroom is? Uh, or excuse me, I'm looking for the bathroom or I'm looking for the restroom. Is this the train for blah, blah, blah? Or is this the train that goes to blah, blah, blah? to confirm with someone that I'm indeed on the correct train line. If I say, is this the train bound for San Francisco? You can use that to check if you're correct. 10 compliments that you always want to hear. Let's go. I love your cooking. This is my personal favorite compliment. Oh my God, I love cooking. Like I'm always posting like pictures of things that I cooked on Twitter. I'm just like crazy about food. Uh, so this would be a compliment that I would love to get. Like the ultimate compliment for me though would be, will you make my birthday cake? That would be such a compliment. Like it's it's a question, but it's it, there's so much behind that. Will you make my birthday cake? I'd be like, oh, you would give that to me? So maybe after, you can use this after a meal, for example. I love your cooking. And the other person will be like. Next is great job, great job. This is a compliment that you can use anytime. You can use it uh, to your, with your friend, with your, not with your boss. Your boss might use it with you, uh, an employee, a coworker, a colleague, a pet even. Whatever, it's, it's just a, a very small scale, a very easy to use compliment. That means you think whatever has just happened is good. I use great job all the time. I use great job and I use good job. Sometimes uh, when I make a mistake or something funny happens and I'm alone at my house and I want to make fun of myself, I'll be like, yeah, great job, Alicia. <laughs> uh, but if I'm, if I'm trying to be positive about a failure or laugh at myself a bit. But in general, uh, it's just a good, easy compliment to give someone. Great job. You have a way with words. You have a way with words. This can be speaking. This can be writing. It means you think that the other person is a good communicator. Or maybe even more so than just a good communicator, you think that the way they speak or the way that they write is particularly good. So that could mean funny, it could mean romantic, it could mean dramatic. Something about the way they speak or the way that they write, you really enjoy that. You can say, you have a way with words. It's quite a nice compliment. I think it's kind of like a, you know, a bit smart. It's a bit of a smart thing. You have a way with words. Hmm. Or you can say you're good with words. You're really good with words. Yeah. All right, next one. You look gorgeous. You look gorgeous. Very nice compliment to give. Just be very careful with the way that you say this. For an everyday compliment, I tend not to say you look nice or you look gorgeous today or something like that because the underlying comment there is on the other days that person doesn't look nice. <laughs> like, so. If I want to compliment someone's appearance, I try to pick a specific thing. I'm like, oh, I've never seen you wear that sweater before. It looks nice on you. Something like that. Like yesterday, my friend had a new dress on and I was like, is that a new dress? And because I, th I thought she looked nice, I th I was, but I didn't, I didn't want to make it sound like I don't think she looks nice every day. So I said, is that a new dress? And she goes, yeah. And I said, I think that color is really, really nice on you. It looks really good. And she was so happy about that. So. Uh, yes, there there are these compliments like you look nice, you look great, you look gorgeous and so on. But I personally kind of prefer to level them up a little bit and just say, pick a specific thing. Like, did you get a new haircut? Did you dye your hair? Or you, did you get something, did something happen? Like what, whatever it is, try to pick up on a specific thing because then that shows you're paying attention to the other person. 
and you think that whatever they have chosen to do, whatever like clothing or whatever haircut, whatever it is, you think that they have good sense there too, or good style. So it's kind of like a double, it's a very subtle double compliment. Yeah. The next word is you have good taste. You have good taste. This can be for uh, food, uh, fashion, style, for decorating sense, uh, music in movies, whatever. If you think that that person's uh, artistic selection in, in whatever capacity, if you think that that person makes good choices with uh, their, uh, their appearance or their hobbies or whatever, you can say you have good taste. This is a fairly sophisticated compliment, I think. We use you have good taste for something like it's it sounds a bit more sophisticated. Maybe if you both choose the same bottle of wine, perhaps like it, it has kind of a more formal adultish sophisticated feeling about it, this compliment. So, yeah, maybe maybe wine is a good example of that. Yeah. Oh, nice bottle choice. Like, I really like that. You have good taste. You can follow this, by the way. You have good taste in blah, blah, blah. Uh, you have good taste in movies. You have good taste in music. If you want to be specific about something that you think that person is really good at choosing, you have good taste in noun. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, next one is you have a great sense of humor. You have a great sense of humor. This is the, this is the underlying compliment in the phrase, you are so funny. This is the underlying compliment. You have a great sense of humor means the other person thinks you are funny, that you are good at telling jokes or you make them laugh. This is actually one of my favorite compliments to get. You have a great sense of humor. Um, yeah, because I think that like, you know, people like to laugh. So it's an, it's an, if someone makes you laugh, you can say this, you have a great sense of humor or you're very funny. Yeah, it's a good one. It's a really good one. Um, so you can say after a joke, for example, or after maybe you've, you're, you've finished laughing at something the other person has said, you can say, ah, you have a great sense of humor. Good. Next one is your resume is impressive. This is a weird compliment to say to your friends, <laughs> unless you're like reviewing your friend's resume. It's a bit weird. This is something that perhaps uh, someone interviewing another person for a job would say. The candidate comes in for the interview. The interviewer says, wow, your resume is very impressive. I'd like to ask you a few questions about it. <laughs> uh, so this is good to hear in a work situation. Yeah, you really probably won't need to use this with your friends. If you do, it's kind of weird. Oh, wow. This next one is quite a compliment. Nobody's ever said this to me. To be fair, if somebody said this next one to me, I would feel a little bit of like pressure. The compliment here is you make me want to be a better person. This is something that I think you see in movies from time to time. Person. Yeah, I've had, I had one person say like, uh, like, uh, oh, that something you did inspired me. Mm. And that was like really like, oh, that was really exciting. Like somebody was inspired by something like, wow, that's great. Or I want to be like you. That's a yeah. really cool compliment. But if someone says, you want to make me be a better person, it's like, oh, wow. Like that means I'm really important to that person, which is really flattering. But at the same time, if someone said that, I would also be like, if it's like my friend, I would be like, but I, I want you to be you. Like, I think you're a cool person already. Yeah, it's like, oh, you make me want to be a better person. Like, in that person's viewpoint, you're like somehow above them and that's uncomfortable. Yeah, just, I would rather say, you inspire me. I think that that, or like this thing that you did really inspired me. Like if somebody said like, I saw that picture that you posted on Twitter of that pizza today, Alicia, and it really inspired me and I made my own pizza. I'd be like, yay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, next one is nice. Actually, I say this to my friends quite a bit. You are an awesome friend. This is really, really good to use after your friend has helped you with something. Maybe you're moving to a new apartment or new house, or maybe you've had some trouble and your friend gave you some good advice, or your friend just listened to you when you really needed to talk to someone. After that experience, you can say, thanks so much, you were an awesome friend. Or maybe your friend did something really, really cool and you just want to like tell them, like, I think you're really awesome. Just say, you are an awesome friend. They'll be happy to hear that. Or just, you can abbreviate it to, you are awesome. Not just you're an awesome friend, just you are awesome. You are a cool person. You are awesome. You're fantastic. You are an awesome friend. You're an awesome friend. 10 ways to motivate yourself when learning English. Let's go. 
The first way to motivate yourself is to imagine that one day you will live in the United States. So to do this, imagine what is your day going to be like when you live in the U.S. Where will you go? Who will you meet? Where will you shop? And so on. Imagine your day in the United States. Okay, the second way to motivate yourself when you're studying English is to study other aspects of the culture too, which makes it more rewarding to study English. Okay. So this means, of course, studying English as a language, but if there's a specific country that you'd like to visit or a specific part of that country's culture, try to learn about that too. If you like music, if you like the food, if you like the history, try to find something about a specific country or a specific part of that country's culture that you enjoy in addition to studying the language. Okay. Way number three to motivate yourself is finding funny words in English. Okay, so finding a word that sounds funny or a word that you enjoy using or a phrase that you enjoy using can really increase your motivation for using that word and for interacting with people. So if you can find those phrases that you think are funny or are fun, they can be really, really helpful for you as you learn your language. The next way to motivate yourself is to make friends with people who speak English. Uh, so, of course, if you don't have any friends who are English speakers, especially native English speakers, it's a really good idea to make some friends. This way you can practice with them, you can learn from them, and you can just see maybe what their life is like and how their life is different from yours. So this is a great way to practice, a great way to learn, and a great way to think more internationally as well. The next way to motivate yourself is watching YouTube videos of other people who have successfully learned English. So you can listen to people, what worked for them, how did they study, where did they go, what materials did they use, uh, what did they find not helpful. Um, so you can try to find a strategy that works well for you through using resources like YouTube, for example. It's a great way to find people um, that maybe match with what you need. Okay, the next way to motivate yourself is by watching English movies and TV shows and enjoying the feeling when you can understand a word or a sentence. Yeah, I do this too. Uh, when you enjoy something, when you find entertainment value in something like music, movies, TV, and you, there's that moment when you pick up or when you understand what your favorite character said or you understand that like a key point in the story, it's a really, really good feeling. It makes you want to continue watching, I think. So that's a really, really nice feeling, I think. And you can do that by enjoying media. Uh, so it's a fun way to learn and it's a fun feeling to experience. Okay. The next way to motivate yourself is by reading English news articles, blogs, and magazines to get a feel for formal and casual language. So the style that we use here, like in English class uh, 101 and the on the videos on this channel is quite casual most of the time, or at least in these videos it's very casual. But the way that I speak and the way a newspaper is written, the way a magazine is written, the way a, uh, a newscaster presents the information, these are all different ways of communicating. We're using the same language, yes, but they are different styles. So it's important to try to understand those differences. Uh, and to become familiar with them. So try to find a few different things that you can enjoy. Uh, the next way to motivate yourself is after dinner, uh, you write about your day in a journal in English. Okay, this is an interesting idea. So just take a few minutes after dinner or before you go to bed to write something in English about what you did that day. Or maybe uh, so you have a chance to talk about future tense or to use the future tense, you can use, uh, you can talk about your upcoming plans or the things you're going to do the next day. So you can talk about past tense, uh, what you did that day, um, maybe present tense, how you're feeling as you're writing your journal for the day, and future tense uh, to talk about your upcoming plans. So journaling can be a really effective exercise for motivating you. Okay, the next way to motivate yourself is by practicing with flashcards of useful words and phrases for 15 minutes every day on the train. I actually do do this, I use, uh, but I use an application to study Japanese, to study kanji. And 15 minutes every day adds up over the course of a week. You, you can learn a lot of information in a short period of time. And uh, if you live in the country where um, your target language is spoken, then 
you might even find the word you studied on the train, you see it like after you leave the train. You might see that word later on in your day. So you can immediately uh, feel like an extra sense of motivation by knowing that this thing you're studying is applicable. It's something you can use right away. It's a really cool feeling. So this is a tip. I honestly, I use this. Last. Uh, I make sure to thank anyone and everyone who corrects my English. Uh, yeah, I, I think this is really important because people are really nice. They don't want to correct you when you make a mistake, but sometimes people do. They're really polite about it and they tell you, the more, tell you a more natural way or they give you a suggestion for how to improve your English. Make sure you say thank you, like repeat after them and then say thank you um, so that, you know, it's motivation for them uh, to tell you again in the future, to help you again in the future. So make sure to say thank you to anyone who helps you with your English. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome back to our English class channel. Today we're going to be talking about the difference between by and until. So let's get started. Okay, so first we're going to talk about by. By marks a deadline for an action to finish. By marks the point where an action completes or is replaced by another action. Uh, so really think about using by to express a deadline. Something is going to stop or you must finish an action uh, at this point in time. So um, we can think about by as marking some point in the future uh, so, by marks some point in the future where an action is going to finish, an action is going to be completed. So, in an example sentence, I have, I'll be at the office by 7 p.m. So, in this sentence, the speaker is not at the office, but 7 p.m. is the deadline. This is the point in time at which the speaker will be at the office. The speaker is not at the office now, but by 7 p.m., by the 7 p.m. deadline, the speaker will be at the office. This will shows us, this is a future tense expression, and by shows us the deadline, the point at which that expression or the point at which that action is going to be completed. So this is how we use by, to think about it like a deadline, some point in time at which an action will be completed or finished. Okay, so let's continue on to the other grammar point for today, which is until. Um, until also has a more casual form. We can use till, uh, T-I-L-L, or apostrophe T-I-L. You might see both spellings used uh, for until, till, or till. Uh, in most cases, it's good to use until. In casual speaking and maybe in casual writing, you can use the casual form. But uh, until is always polite and is always correct. Okay, so when we use until, let's talk about when to use until. We use until to talk about a continuing situation or a continuing state now in the present or in the future but it's going to change or stop. Mm. So the key difference, one key difference here perhaps, is a continuing situation, a continuing state. With by, the nuance is a deadline. Something is going to finish at a deadline. Here, however, until gives us the nuance of something that's continuing. Uh, something true now, for example, uh, but that may not be true in the future until marks the point where that action or that state is going to finish or change. Hmm. Okay, so uh, we can think of it rather than as a deadline, as a key point in the future somewhere where action A continues until a point where we use until and then a second action begins. Mm. Something is going to change at the until point. With by, however, we don't have the nuance of an action changing. We only have the nuance of a deadline. 
So here, until is used to show that something different is going to happen, uh, or something, uh, something will finish, um, but there's going to be a change uh, after the, the until point. So for example, um, this sentence, very similar to the by example sentence, is I'll be at the office until 7 p.m. So here we have the future tense, I'll, I will, I'll be at the office until 7 p.m. This sentence shows us the speaker is at the office right now. However, at 7 p.m., until shows us that 7 p.m. is the point at which the situation or the state is going to change. So at 7 p.m., the speaker is probably going to leave the office. Until shows us that right here, the action or the state is going to change. So please keep that in mind. Until shows you a change in something. By shows more of a deadline for an action uh, that is continuing. So I hope that we can practice this in a few example sentences now. OK, so let's try to choose the correct uh, word to use in these example sentences. Should we use by or should we use until in these cases? So the first one I have is uh, he has to find a new job, blah, 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 March. So in this case, we see a point in time. Uh, we can think about it. Should we use by or until here? If we use by, we see that uh, the deadline, the deadline nuance matches here. He has to find a new job by March. If we use until, he has to find a new job until March. There's no information in this sentence that shows us a hint or that gives us a hint about how the action is going to change. Until does not make sense for this question. So we should use by in this case. He has to find a new job by March is the correct answer for this sentence. In the second sentence, uh, I'm not going to go to bed, blah, blah, blah. I finish this movie. So in this sentence, we have at the end, uh, I finish this movie. So there's some action uh, maybe that's continuing here. Uh, and we have another action. I'm not going to go to bed. In this case, it's a negative. So there are two actions here. This is a pretty good hint that there's an action that's going to change at some point instead of the nuance of a deadline. So for this sentence, until is the best answer. I'm not going to go to bed until <clears throat> until I finish this movie. This shows us that at this point, the point where I finish the movie, I'm going to go to bed. This marks the change in the continuing state or the continuing situation. So the next sentence is, uh, they need to write their reports, blah, 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 tomorrow. So this sentence, uh, there's no change in the sentence. We don't have any hints about some kind of different action that's going to happen. Instead, we have maybe what seems to be a deadline, some requirement here too. Um, so if we try to use until, it doesn't make sense. There's no changing action. We can't guess about what might happen in the future or a change that might happen. So by is the best answer here. They need to write their reports by tomorrow. Tomorrow is the deadline. So we can guess that tomorrow is the deadline here. By shows us that it's the deadline in this case for this task. All right. Uh, let's take a look at something a little bit different. Here we have, we can't leave the house, blah, 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 your mother calls. So again, there are two situations, there are two actions uh, involved in this sentence. We have leave the house and your mother calls, uh, makes a phone call. So because there are two actions here, we can guess that there's some change that's going to happen. So because we learned, that until marks a change in actions, we know that until is the better answer here. Okay, we can't leave the house until your mother calls would be the correct sentence here. All right, uh, so let's look at the next sentence though. This one is a tricky sentence. This one is a little bit difficult. We have, I'm not going to be there 
something something 8 p.m. Mm. So here we have 8 p.m. at the end of a sentence, which looks like a deadline, right? We have uh, going to be there. Mm. So should we use by or until for this sentence? It's difficult because actually both are okay for this sentence. I'm not going to be there by 8 p.m. is correct. And I'm not going to be there until 8 p.m. is also correct. However, the meanings are very different. Just as we practiced in these two sentences, I'll be at the office until, I'll be at the office by 7 p.m., the same is true here. I'm not going to be there by 8 p.m. means I'm not going to be there at 8 p.m. It's not possible for me. I can't go. However, I'm not going to be there until 8 p.m. This sentence means after 8 p.m. or beginning at 8 p.m. and after I'm going to be there. So please be careful. In some cases, both by and until are correct, but they change the meaning of the sentence. Okay. Let's continue to another example. So uh, the next example sentence is also a little bit difficult. Uh, it's, if my date doesn't arrive, something, something, 7 p.m., I'm leaving. Okay, so here we, have, we do have two actions. Uh, doesn't arrive, my date doesn't arrive, a negative point, and I'm leaving. So it seems like there are two actions here, however, we have this 7 p.m. This marks a deadline, right? So uh, if my date doesn't arrive, there's some deadline here. If this is not uh, completed, something is going to happen. The person is going to leave. So in this case, 7 p.m. is showing a deadline. So we have to use by. If my date doesn't arrive until 7 p.m., we could use that, but it doesn't sound so natural. So uh, the nuance again here is of a deadline. There's something that is going to happen uh, at 7 p.m. 7 p.m. marks the end point in this situation. So we use by here. Okay, let's go to the next pair. Again, these are very interesting points. Uh, we have to leave the beach, blah, 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 10 a.m. And we have to stay at the beach, blah, 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 10 a.m. Okay, so these two sentences I included because I wanted to show the emphasis of changing actions and continuing actions. So we can see the verbs are different here. In the first sentence, we have leave. So this is a change, uh, leaving a location. In the second sentence, I have stay, which shows a, a continuing action, stay in one place. So here, as you can guess then, we have to leave the beach, blah, 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 10 a.m. Some change, some deadline. So we'll use by to show our deadline. In the second sentence, we have to stay at the beach. Stay shows a continuing action. And then it's going to finish here. So we'll use until. We have to stay at the beach until 10 a.m. This shows us a continuing action. And maybe at 10 a.m. we'll leave the beach. All right. Uh, let's go on to the next sentence. I'm not going to travel abroad, blah, blah, blah. I learn English. Okay, so here there's no time point. There's no 10 a.m., 8 p.m., uh, tomorrow, and so on. So this is a little more complex, maybe. We have travel abroad and learn English. So it seems there's no real uh, deadline here. But we have maybe a change. Maybe this shows us some kind of change. Learning English marks a change. So uh, I'm not going to travel abroad until I learn English. Mm. This shows us that something uh, different is going to happen in the future. So we should use until to mark that change. OK, our last example sentence for today is we told him to wake up, blah, 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 6 a.m. So once more, our last sentence may be a little bit uh, simple, but 6 a.m. shows us an action, sort of this deadline. You can see a lot of these 
use a time to mark a deadline for an action. So here we told him to wake up by 6 a.m. This is the point at which something must happen. So we should use by here. Okay, great. So those are a few example sentences that you can have a look at and think about uh, when you're trying to decide whether to use by or until. Keep in mind, however, there are some cases where both by or until are correct, but the meaning is going to change significantly depending on the one you use. So uh, I hope this lesson was useful for you. If you have any questions or if you want to try to make an example sentence using by or until, please be sure to leave us a comment. If you liked this video too, please be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Thanks very much for watching this episode and we will see you again soon. Bye! Ten words for connecting thoughts. These are going to be ten words that you can use to transition between ideas. Very useful in both speech and in writing. Let's go. Also, also, also is a word that you can use to add information. I went to the store this morning. Also, I went and got coffee. That's true. However, However, however is used to contrast, or to contrast, depending on your pronunciation, to differentiate, to show a difference between two pieces of information. A good pattern would be A, however, B. So, for example, I love tonkotsu ramen. However, it is very high in calories, so I don't eat it often. Also true. On the other hand, on the other hand, on the other hand is, I feel, used more commonly in speech than it is in writing. Um, again, it's used to present like two sides to a story or two sides to some information. So, for example, mm, I'm thinking about visiting Taiwan sometime this year, but on the other hand, I'm also thinking about visiting Thailand. Still. So it might be common to use still with a word like but or a word like even though. So you're saying even though there's some other factor, like, um, like I'm really, really tired this week, or even though I have a lot of homework to do, I still want to go out with my friends, or I still want to um, see a movie this weekend. So there's this other, there's this thing that's maybe makes this other action difficult to do or tough to do or whatever. Um, but even though there's this, you still have this over here. So maybe the two are kind of used as a pair. So I still want to go out later, even though I'm tired. Then. Then. Yes, a very useful word. We use then when telling stories a lot. Um, so for example, if I could tell a story about my morning today. When I got up, I brushed my teeth, and then <laughs> I cooked breakfast, then I did a little bit of work, then I took a shower, then I did some cooking, blah, blah, blah. You'll often hear and then as well. And then I, and then we, and then you, and so on. So then is, is really, really useful for sequence. So a useful word, I think. Besides, besides. So it's commonly used in a pattern like besides that, meaning other than something else. I went out with my friends this weekend, but besides that, I didn't really do much. So another way to say that sentence is, I went out with my friends this weekend, but other than that, other than that activity, I didn't do very much. Hmm. Okay. Meanwhile, meanwhile, or you might hear the similar expression in the meantime. It means while you're doing action A, at the same time, maybe somewhere else, action B is happening. This is used while telling stories a lot. So for example, I was working at my office all week last week, Meanwhile, my coworkers across town were having a party without me. <laughs> so these two things are happening at the same time, uh, but maybe separate from one another. Meanwhile. Likewise. Okay, likewise. I don't really use this word personally myself at all. It's often used after an introduction, um, similar to the pleasure is all mine in a formal situation. So maybe somebody says, you know, hey, it was really great to see you last weekend. Thanks very much for coming to my barbecue. 
you can say, yeah, likewise, it was really good to see you and your family. So likewise means I have the same feeling or I have the same idea. It's kind of a friendly phrase, but personally, I don't really use that to transition between thoughts. Um, I would just use and, I suppose, but no, no. Uh, that's how I would use it. Instead, instead. So, so instead, it, it's used like instead of. I want to A instead of B can be used to express your plans or what you want to do. I want to have Chinese food instead of Italian food tonight. So you're, you're presenting two alternatives, essentially. So instead of means in place of or as a substitute for. So I should have drank a lot of water this morning, but instead I drank a lot of coffee. That's true. Uh, I wanted to um, have dinner with my friends this weekend. Instead, I had dinner at home. In addition, in addition, this is a really good word for more formal situations. I like to use in addition in writing. I don't really use in addition in speaking unless I'm trying to be very formal for some reason, uh, similar to additionally as well. So you make point A and point B, and then when you want to make one more point that's related to point A and point B, you can say, in addition, point C. So you're like building an argument and in addition can be used to kind of finish that argument off a little bit. Our new marketing plan worked really well last month. We noticed increased sales in product A. In addition, uh, we've gained a lot of new customers, something like that. So just you're, you're quickly presenting a series of ideas that are related to one another. You can use in addition to finish it off. 20 words you'll need for the beach. Let's go. Sunglasses. The first word is sunglasses. Sunglasses are those dark glasses that you wear on your face when it's bright outside. In a sentence, I forgot my sunglasses. Hold on, I forgot my sunglasses. Beach. Beach is the place near the ocean. You might have a beach in your city or in your country. Uh, the beach is usually visited in the summertime. Uh, the image is lots of sun, you can get a tan, you can get a sunburn, uh, but it's usually a fun place to spend time with family and friends. In a sentence, I'm going to the beach with my friends this weekend, I'm so excited. In this sentence, she walked along the beach. Swimming. The next word is swimming. Swimming is of course a popular activity to do at the beach. I go swimming at the beach every summer. Or in this sentence, be very careful when swimming in the Pacific Ocean. There might be sharks. Sun. Sun is that big bright thing in the sky that will make your skin change color if you stay in it for too long. <laughs> so the sun, um, in a sentence, the sun is really bright. Let's get out of the sun. Palm tree. The next word is palm tree. So palm trees are a, are, are a type of tree. They're usually seen in like tropical places, like Hawaii has palm trees, any place close to the equator, the, the middle line of the earth. Uh, I think that's where palm trees tend to grow. It's kind of an image of the beach. Uh, so palm trees. Mm, there are a lot of palm trees near the beach in California. That palm tree is almost 60 feet tall. Seashell. The next word is seashell. Seashell are those little objects you find on the beach, like in the sand or in the water. In some cases, they're like uh, shells from like clams or maybe oysters sometimes too, depending on what you consider a seashell. But if you break the word down, it's sea and shell. So like something from the ocean and the shell or like the covering, the outside of something. So usually a small creature, a small animal has lived inside the seashell. Um, and then you can collect them and, I don't know, look at them or make something from them. Little kids like to collect them. I used to collect seashells when I was a kid. Oh my gosh, look at this example sentence. It says, it's bad luck to take seashells from the beach. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Swimsuit. Swimsuit is the clothing you wear to swim in, your swimming suit. There are men's swimsuits, women's swimsuits. Usually men's swimsuits are uh, like uh, shorts, board shorts, or I suppose there's the, what like Speedo makes like the men's swimsuits as well, the really small ones. And then for women, they have uh, one piece swimsuits they have, and then they have bikini swimsuits, the two piece swimsuits. So in a sentence, I, Hate swimsuit shopping. In this sentence, I need a new swimsuit this summer. 
Ocean. The next word is ocean. Ocean is the big blue, the big water, the big deep blue sea. In a sentence, the ocean is so beautiful at night. In this sentence, he dipped his feet in the ocean. Lifeguard. Lifeguard. A lifeguard is a person at the beach. Lifeguard. So someone who guards lives. If someone gets into trouble in the water, they start to drown or they start to have trouble. If there's an accident at the beach, the lifeguard at the beach is responsible for handling that problem. So they'll call an ambulance or they know how to do first aid to save people. Uh, so in a sentence, it's important to go to beaches where there are lifeguards available if you need help. In this sentence, uh, there isn't a lifeguard on duty here. Jet ski. Next word is jet ski. A jet ski is a like a water motorcycle. You can ride around it on with your friends uh, alone. Riding jet skis is a lot of fun. In this sentence, if you have a driver's license, you can drive a jet ski. Beach towel. The next expression is beach towel. Beach towel. Beach towel is different from regular towel because usually beach towels have like a bright color or a bright pattern or um, there are towels that you don't mind or towels that are okay to get sand or dirt in them. Usually in a towel you use in your house, you don't want to get your towel really, really dirty. So a beach towel is a towel you use only at the beach. In a sentence, I bought a new beach towel and it has a picture of a hamburger on it. In this sentence, oh no, I got sand all over my beach towel. That's the point of beach towel. Beach chair. The next expression is beach chair. As you can probably guess, it is a chair you use only at the beach. So again, this is a chair you don't mind. It's okay if it gets dirty or sandy. Usually a beach chair is easy to fold or easy to carry too. Uh, in a sentence, I have a couple of beach chairs that I'm going to bring to the barbecue this weekend. In this sentence, can we use these beach chairs? Sandcastle. The next word is sandcastle. Sandcastles are usually kids make them. They use like buckets. So kids will like put sand in a bucket or like they move sand into piles and design castles or these really complicated mazes or something. They make things, make buildings out of sand. We call those sand castles. Um, so in a sentence, my brother and I used to make sand castles on the beach when we were kids. That's true. In this sentence, get the buckets and we'll make a sand castle. Cooler. So cooler is a noun in this case. Cooler is the place you keep your drinks and your food. It's a, it, it looks like a suitcase, but it has a special lining inside that keeps cold things cold. So you can put ice inside and it will keep your food and drinks cold while you are at the beach in the hot weather. So in a sentence, uh, did you put a bunch of beers in the cooler? I forgot ice for the cooler. Tide. The next word is tide. Tide is the level of the water, the, the level of the ocean water at different times of day. So if you are interested in this sort of thing, you might know about high tide and low tide. High tide means the water level at the beach is high. Low tide means the water level at the beach is low. So tide is uh, how high or low the water is. In this sentence, uh, the tide ebbed and revealed a starfish. Ebbed means it went away a little bit. So tide is the flow of water. Tan. So tan is, uh, we use it as a noun, like to get a tan in a sentence. It means that your skin turns a darker color. So um, be careful, there are two words we use in English. Tan means your skin gets a little bit darker. And we also use the word sunburn or just burn. Burn means your skin gets red. It means like it's damaged, It maybe your skin peels a bit. So. Um, in America anyway, in the U.S. anyway, a tan is usually considered a positive thing. Many people want uh, tan skin, but uh, sunburn, where your skin is red and damaged, is bad. So be careful. Those are two different words we use to talk about this, the changing skin color. I got a tan last summer at the beach. In this sentence, you got such a nice tan in Florida. Snorkeling. The next word is snorkeling. Snorkeling is really, really fun. Snorkeling is swimming, but you have a like a hose, you have a pipe 
uh, that you can breathe through as you swim. So you can, you usually put goggles, you wear goggles as you're swimming in the ocean. You can look down and see fish or you can see things in the ocean, but you can still breathe. So this is a really fun thing to do to look at fish or just to, just to hang out and see a different point of view. I went snorkeling for the first time maybe when I was 22, 23. In this sentence, she bought goggles so that she could go snorkeling in Hawaii. Flip-flop. The next word is flip-flop. Flip-flop is a very common beach sandal. Many people like to wear flip-flops in everyday life too. Some people prefer not to, it's up to you. Uh, like in California, I know, especially in beach towns, everybody just wears flip-flops, it's very comfortable. Uh, so flip-flops kind of have an image of being a little bit cheap or just very, very simple. It's, it's the most basic possible sandal. Why are they called flip-flops? Because I, I always thought it was because of the sound that they make. <laughs> sound, I guess. Maybe it sounds like flip-flop. In a sentence, I usually don't wear flip-flops. In this sentence, these flip-flops keep breaking. Sunscreen. Next word is sunscreen. Sunscreen, or you might also hear sunblock. These are uh, products you can put on your skin to prevent a tan or to prevent a sunburn. Sunscreen, so it's a protection. It's a protection against the sunlight. <laughs> I just hit this screen. So sunscreen is uh, quite important. Like uh, it is said that you should use sunscreen to prevent, to help prevent skin cancer. In a sentence, I'm out of sunscreen. I need to buy more. In this sentence, mom, I don't need sunscreen. Bikini. The next word is bikini. Bikini. We talked about um, swimsuit a little bit earlier, but bikini is usually a swimsuit for women. And it's uh, two pieces. There's a bottom half and an upper half. And oftentimes the, the top half of the bikini, or sometimes the bottom half, you have to tie a knot or you have to latch something. I suppose if you don't tie it carefully, it can create a problem, like it could fall off. So bikini, it's a popular style of swimsuit for women. Are you going to wear your bikini to the beach tomorrow? In this sentence, my bikini came undone in front of everyone. It was so embarrassing five sentence patterns that you can use as a beginner of English. Let's go. The first expression that you can use as a beginner is personally, I think that, or I would just use, I think that. Personally makes it sound a little bit more polite, I think. You can use this to introduce an opinion. For example, personally, I think that pizza is amazing. Personally, I think that dinosaurs would have been delicious. <laughs> Personally, I think that cars should be made to enjoy with friends. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna edit there. Personally, I think that you shouldn't worry about it. Yes, that's probably a much more useful sentence than dinosaurs would be delicious. <laughs> the next expression is what does blah 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 mean. So where here is the word you don't know. So for example, what does pasta mean? What does stegosaurus mean? So a word like stegosaurus is a really strange word that you probably don't know. Stegosaurus is a type of dinosaur. We're on a very dinosaurs, I don't know, it Jurassic. we're on a Jurassic adventure at the moment. So this is a pattern you use when you don't know uh, when you don't know the meaning of the word and you would like someone to explain it to you. So if you say, what does stegosaurus mean? Then someone can say, oh, it's a dinosaur. It's kind of like, sh it's a sort of short guy and it has a bunch of spikes on its back and it has a long tail and it gets into a fight with a Tyrannosaurus Rex if you saw the movie Fantasia by Disney. Okay. <laughs> so in this sentence, what does complication mean? It means problem. Okay. The next pattern you can use is, can you tell me more about blah, blah, blah. So on a topic that you would like more information about, you can say, can you tell me more about the soccer game last week? Can you tell me more about the plan for the party next week? So something you would like more information about, you can say, can you tell me more about this thing? Okay, so in a sentence, can you tell me more about your sandwich options? That is a useful sentence. Very useful. That is a useful sentence. Okay. In this sentence here, uh, we don't have that back home. Can you tell me more about it? Mm, this is used the reverse pattern. Hmm. 
Okay. Uh, the next expression is if it were up to me, if it were up to me, oh, I had to teach this in a class a couple weeks ago, actually. If it were up to me means if I could make the decision, if this was my, if this were my decision, uh, blah, blah, blah. So meaning if I could make the choice, this is what I would do. But one point here is the nuance is it is not my decision. This is not my decision. But if it were my decision, I would do blah, blah, blah. So, for example, if it were up to me, every day would be Saturday. Woo, 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 but it's not, right? So, um, that's, that's always the underlying, that's always the kind of basic um, nuance of this phrase. Some, this decision is not mine. Okay, here the example is, if it were up to me, I would take my boss to dinner. Oh my, <laughs> things just got scandalous. <laughs> The next pattern is I feel like blah, blah, blah. You can use I feel like when you introduce a, a suggestion or something that you would like to do, especially for food, drinks, or activities. So, for example, I feel like coffee. I feel like Italian food. I feel like an action movie. There's some activity or something you would like to do at the end of this pattern. I feel like bowling this afternoon. Something needs to go here, some sort of activity. Um, of course, you can use this expression to talk about your feelings. I feel like something, but this something must be a noun. It must be a noun. Like, if you feel really great, I feel like a million bucks, for example. If you feel really bad, I feel like garbage. <laughs> That's a nice expression that somehow just came out of my head. Anyway, um, you can use this in two ways, but this must be completed with a noun phrase at the end of the sentence. 10 things to do in the summer in the United States. So let's go. To travel abroad, to travel abroad, to travel abroad. Abroad means outside of your country. So meaning to travel to a place not the United States in my case. Please don't forget to in this expression. So many of my students will say, this uh, summer I'm going Europe. You need to use to before the place. You do not, however, need to use to before there. So like students sometimes will say, uh, I want to go to there. You can't do that. You have to use to before the specific name of a place. There is not a specific place, so you don't need to use to. Keep that one in mind. To relax at the beach. To relax at the beach. Ah, that sounds fantastic right now. To relax at the beach. You go to the beach and you just relax there. You lay in the sun, you go swimming, maybe you drink a beer, you get a tan if you would like to do that. Of course, some people don't. You put on sunscreen, whatever it is that you like to do at the beach, you just do that and enjoy. In a sentence, I would rather relax at the beach than have a really active vacation. To learn English with EnglishClass101.com. To learn English with EnglishClass101.com. Thanks. So I guess if you are very ambitious this summer, good for you. You can learn English by doing what you're doing now. Uh, or I think you can visit, I presume you can visit the website for more content there too. I'm going to put my time to good use and learn English at EnglishClass101.com. To have a barbecue. Oh yeah, the next one is one of my favorite things ever to do in summer, wherever I am. It's to have a barbecue or to have a BBQ is also okay, but barbecue usually. BBQ is in like writing. I love having barbecues with my friends in the summer. Every 4th of July, my family has a big barbecue. To party all night. The next expression is to party all night. To party all night, you don't, it doesn't have to be summer or the United States to party all night. Just saying. <laughs> anyway, to party all night means to do something you enjoy, presumably with your friends or not, I guess. I partied like all night at home. I tweeted pajamas are the best and then I tweeted a picture of myself really excited about a cookie and was very embarrassed about that the next day, so I deleted it in the morning. <laughs> Since I won't have school in the morning, I'm going to party all night. In a different sentence, I don't like partying all night. I get tired. I always hit a wall at like 3 a.m. Like I'm like, yay, and then 3 a.m. I'm like, I'm ready to sleep. To get a tan. To get a tan. To get a tan. It's, in some cultures, this is a good thing. In some cultures, it's not a good thing. 
It means to sit in the sun or lay in the sun and let the sun、uh, change the color of your skin. Be careful. There's there are two expressions in English. There is one to get a tan, and another is to get a sun burn. So in U.S. culture, anyway, getting a tan means like your skin turns like a darker brown color. But when it turns red, it's bad. That means you burned your skin. So tan good, burn bad. So we have two separate words、uh, to describe that. In a sentence, you'll find me poolside getting a tan to go hiking. The next expression is to go hiking. So hiking means walking or trekking, usually in a mountain or in a nature setting. So in a sentence, I used to go hiking with my family every summer. That's roughly true. In this sentence, I'm going to hike the Pacific Crest Trail to work a part-time job. The next expression is to work a part-time job. To work a part-time job is very common if you're a student, especially. So when you have your summer vacation, it's a chance for you to earn a little bit of money by working at a part-time job.、Uh, in a sentence, unfortunately, she can't go because she has to work at her part-time job. Ah, when I was a teenager. I had a part-time job at a golf course. Yeah, because I was on the golf team at school. Very convenient, lovely experiences. A plus, everybody. To have fun with friends. To have fun with friends. Also, something that you do not need to only do in summer, but which you can do anytime. We're having fun now, aren't we? Yay! <laughs> so, to have fun with friends is just to enjoy time with your friends. It's great. Uh, in a sentence, I love having fun with my friends whenever I can. He has fun with friends, but he doesn't do much else. Oh, to attend summer school. The next one is to attend summer school. To attend summer school usually has kind of a bad image, and I feel in you in the U.S. anyway, because it sounds like maybe you missed something in regular school.、Um, but for some people, maybe there's a special course they want to attend, or like a special internship program, or just something special. Extra that they would like to study. In a sentence,、uh, I hated going to summer school when I was a kid. Since I failed the class, I'll have to attend summer school. Twenty must-know family words. So let's go. Mother. Mother is the person who gave birth to you. Mother. You can say mom, mother, mom, mama, mommy.、Uh, my mother has amazing cooking. It's true. Father. Father. Father is the person who did not give birth to you, but who. Helped make you happen. <laughs>、uh, so we say father, dad, daddy, pa, pop. My father is a very level-headed person. That's also true. Sister. Sister is a female sibling. So my brother might say, I have an older sister. Anyone who is, yeah,、uh, a female sibling or someone you can use this for friends that you feel very, very close to. Like she's like my sister. That's fine as well. Brother, brother. We sometimes use bro for this.、Uh, I would say I have a younger brother.、Uh, like sister, you can use brother for any male that you feel is similar to a brother, someone you feel very close to. So he's like a brother to me, or you're like my brother. Grandmother, grandmother. When you put grand plus something else. Uh, it means the next generation, or, or the the previous generation. So you have your mother and father. In this case, grandmother means your mother or your father's、uh, mother. It can be either of them. So grandmother. My grandmother was born a long time ago. Grandfather. Grandfather. So just like grandmother,、uh, your mother or your father's father is your grandfather. My grandfather liked to play tennis. That's true. Uncle. Uncle. Your uncle is either your mother or your father's brother. Someone、uh, directly related to one of your parents who is a man is your uncle.、Uh, my uncle is very good with woodworking. Also true. Aunt, aunt. You might also hear aunt. Both of them are correct. You can say aunt or aunt. An aunt or an aunt is your mother or your father's female sibling. One of my aunts gave me a stamp collection when I was a little kid. That's also true. Cousin, cousin,、uh, cousin is your aunt or uncle's children. It can be on any side. So typically, these people are of the same generation as you. Not always, but cousins are generally about the same age. At least in my family, they are. It's really fun to see all my cousins at family barbecues. 
nephew. Nephew. A nephew is a sibling's male child. So if you have a brother or a sister and they have children, any male children are your nephews. Nephews. I don't have any nephews. Niece. Niece, niece. So your brother or your sister's female children, uh, any female children they have, you can say, she's my niece, or I have two nieces. How many nieces do you have? Or I have a lot of nieces. Wife. Wife. So this is a female partner that you are married to. She is my wife. Or how is your wife? Wife is only used when you are married to that person. Husband husband is a male that someone is married to. So, uh, how is your husband? This is my husband. Again, husband is only used when you are married to that person. Parent. Parent. Parent, uh, it's typically used generally for a mother or a father, like I'm a parent, he is my parent, she is my parent. It's often used in the plural, they are my parents, these are my parents. My parents are home, my parents are not at home. <laughs> but you can also use parent to describe someone who raised you. So maybe your biological mother or father did not raise you, but someone else, like an aunt or an uncle, or perhaps a different figure in your community did raise you. You can say, she's like a parent to me, or she had a, a parenting role in my life. Child, child, child is a, a small human. A small human <laughs> is a child. It doesn't necessarily have to be of your family. Like if you're just at the park and you see kids running around, you can say, oh, look at that child. You can use a uh, child in the singular, but be careful. Child changes in the plural form to children. So not childs, but children. Uh, one child, two children. Please be careful. This has an irregular plural form. Uh, maybe I'll have a child someday. Son. Son is a male child, a male offspring. Mm. My uncle has a lot of sons. That's not true. Daughter. Daughter. A daughter is a female child. I wonder if I will ever have a daughter. Brother-in-law. Brother-in-law. So we use in-law to mean our married partner's family members. Uh, not my brother, but my partner's brother. In-law is used after any family member's position or family member's title uh, to show they, they belong to my partner's family originally. But now they're part of my, my extended family as well. Uh, I'm going out for drinks with my brother-in-law tomorrow night. Father-in-law. Father-in-law. So we have in-law here, meaning uh, my partner's father. So my father-in-law is very kind. Mother-in-law. Mother-in-law, meaning my partner's mother. In a sentence, my mother-in-law and I get along really well. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Today I'm going to be talking about the simple future tense. Today I'm going to talk about will and won't and going to and not going to. So these are a few grammar points that learners make mistakes with. When should you use will or won't? When should you use going to or not going to? So I'm going to talk about a few of these points, a few basic points that I hope can help you decide when to use will and when to use going to. So let's begin. Okay. The first point I want to talk about is going to or not going to. Uh, the positive form and the negative form. Going to, not going to. Uh, for today, I want to talk about two times when we'll use these uh, grammar points. So the first time, uh, the first situation where you use going to or not going to is for plans decided before the conversation. So if you make a decision about your future plans or someone else makes the decision before the conversation about their plans for the future, you should use going to or not going to. Uh, it's something that is probably going to happen, a high certainty. <clears throat> so this is a plan that has a high level of certainty, meaning there's a good chance this plan is going to happen. You decided it before the conversation, meaning you've probably had some time to plan uh, your future, to plan your schedule a little bit. So please use going to for something you decide before the conversation. So on a timeline, it might look like this. We have past, uh, now, and future. 
here. So your plan is for the future, yes. But you decided on the plan sometime before the conversation. So if this point, this is now, this is your conversation, you made the plan, you made the decision before the conversation. In this case, use going to. I'm going to. At the beginning of this video I said I'm going to talk about simple future tense, will and going to. I decided before this video started uh, about my plans. I decided what I was going to talk to you about before the video started. So I used going to to introduce that plan. Uh, so please keep this in mind. Okay, but let's talk about will now. So we use will and won't for decisions that are made at the moment of speaking. Uh, so keep in mind, will is the positive form, won't is the negative form here. So a decision made at the moment of speaking. This is one way to use will or won't. Uh, you can use this, for example, at restaurants. Uh, you can use this to talk about plans you make quickly after learning information from a friend. Keep in mind, will and won't, uh, tends to have a lower certainty. There's a lower chance the plan is going to happen uh, because you made the plan at the moment of speaking. Going to is used for plans made before the conversation, but will is used for a plan made uh, spur of the moment or a very quick plan you've just made. So that's kind of the image. Is the decision you just made? Use will or use won't in those cases. If you made the decision before the conversation, there's a good chance you should use going to. So, to go back to our timeline here, if going to is used for a decision you made in the past about your future plans, will is used for a decision you make in the conversation, during the conversation. The plan can be any time in the future, but the decision the point at which you make the decision is the difference here. Mm. Uh, one point about this, two points about this actually. First, will. If you've made a decision at the moment of speaking and you therefore should use will to communicate that decision, you can improve or you can communicate that there's a high chance it's going to happen with the word probably. Mm. So here, I'll show you this in an example sentence in a moment, but you can use probably with will and won't. I'll probably, I probably won't. Remember that order though. I'll probably, or I probably will, or probably won't. Mm. Uh, point number two I want to mention about both of these grammar points is to make your pronunciation a little more natural. Try shortening both of these expressions. Going to shortens to gonna, G-O-N-N-A, gonna. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna. This sounds much more natural, at least in American English. Uh, for will and for won't, when you use will, use the contracted form with your subject. For example, I will becomes I'll. You will becomes you'll. They will becomes they'll. Using the contracted form sounds a lot more natural in everyday conversation. It's correct to say you will, they will, but it sounds really stiff and unnatural. So please use the contracted form to sound a bit more natural. You can use the contracted form with probably for will. I'll probably, they'll probably, we'll probably. These are all pretty good. Okay, so let's practice using them. All right, first example sentence, maybe something something, go hiking tomorrow. So how do we know? Is this a will sentence or a going to sentence? We have a hint here, maybe. Maybe. So meaning there's a low level of certainty, perhaps. A low chance that this is going to happen. So, let's say, maybe I'll go hiking tomorrow. This is probably the best answer. Maybe I'm going to. Uh, while you can communicate the idea, yes, it sounds like you decided your plan before the conversation, but you're using maybe. So it doesn't quite match. Instead, use I'll. Maybe I'll go hiking tomorrow. 
Okay, let's look at the next sentence. I'm, mm, there's a big hint here, a grammar hint. I'm something something, go to France next year. So next year, this go to France next year, this is a pretty big decision. Most people probably would not make this decision at the moment of speaking. So we should use going to. I'm going to go to France next year. This is the correct uh, use of going to in this case. A decision made before the moment of speaking and there's a high level of certainty here. Okay, uh, let's look at the next one. I decided, here's a hint, past tense decided, if you watched a different video, uh, oops, I decided uh, that I'm something something, go out for dinner. I'm too tired. Okay, so past tense, this shows us a big hint. Past tense, decided, this implies the decision was made before the conversation. Hmm. So I'm something something, go out for dinner. I'm too tired, here's another hint. So go out for dinner and too tired. Mm, this should probably be, I'm not going to go out for dinner. I'm too tired. So this person has decided, hmm, I'm not going to go out for dinner. We should use going to, the negative not going to, because the speaker made the decision before the conversation happened and there's a high level of certainty. There's a high chance that this is going to happen. So we should use going to in this sentence. Okay. Okay, so the next sentence I included because I think it's a really good one to remember. Anytime you visit a bar, a restaurant, some kind of service situation, you can use this pattern specifically to make a request for something. So let's take a look. Here, my example sentence is, I something something, have a glass of wine, please. In this case, maybe it's at a restaurant or at a bar. Um, but in this case, you've just made the decision, looking at the menu, looking at a catalog, looking at something, uh, you made a decision just then, at that moment, and you're asking for that item, you're asking for that service. So, we'll use will. I'll have a glass of wine, please. So in this example sentence, I used glass of wine to show my request, to ask for a glass of wine. But if you want to use this pattern to make a request in a service situation, just replace glass of wine with the item or service that you would like. So for example, I'll have a beer, I'll have a steak, I'll have a hamburger. These are all things you can order at a restaurant or at a bar. Uh, if you're shopping, you can say, I'll have the blue one, please, for example. So just make your request uh, using the same pattern, but replacing that glass of wine section that I used in my example sentence. Okay, next one. Uh, this one is maybe a little bit challenging. Uh, it's you're running late, so you, something, something, have to take a taxi to your next meeting. So maybe this is an assistant or someone supporting another person with their schedule. Okay, so in the next sentence, uh, we're looking at a situation where there's been a sudden or quick change to a schedule. Someone is running late and there's a new decision that's made at the moment of speaking or a new decision is made to reflect the new situation. So let's take a look. You're running late, so you will, or you will, have to take a taxi. Mm. You could say uh, you're running late, so you have to take a taxi, but maybe this is a future plan, something that's going to happen in an hour from now. Maybe this is something uh, the speaker is planning for later in the day. So you will is a nice way to use that. You're running late, so you'll have to take a taxi hmm, to the next meeting. Okay, the last one I want to talk about, this uses probably, which I mentioned over here. So probably, remember, we can use probably to sort of improve, or we can use probably to communicate a higher level of certainty with the decision we made at the moment of speaking. So here, uh, you're not going to the party, then I probably something something go either. 
Okay, so either is a big hint here. Remember, we use either to show agreement, but negative. Okay, so in the last example sentence for today, uh, we're going to look at a situation where the listener has heard some new information. They use the expression, you're not going to go to the party, so they're confirming new information they have just heard. After that, they're going to make a decision about what their plans are for the party. So let's take a look. We know that probably it can be used with will and won't. And we know from then the speaker just made this decision. And we know it's a negative with either. So we should use won't. You're not going to go to the party then I probably won't go either. So the speaker uses uh, won't here to show a decision made at the moment of speaking, but the speaker also uses probably won't to show there's a high chance that this is going to happen. There's a high chance that this is the future plan. Probably won't. Okay, so there's a lot of information communicated there with small words like then and either and probably as well. So please keep this in mind when you're trying to decide when to use will, won't, going to, and not going to. Okay, so, uh, so that's my recap of a few useful grammar points, how to talk about your future tense plans. Uh, so I'm going to finish the lesson now. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed this lesson. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave it in a comment. Or if you want to try out a few practice sentences, please feel free to leave those in the comment section too. If you haven't already, please uh, be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel too. If you want to find more stuff like this, more lessons, more information like this, you can check out EnglishClass101.com. Thanks very much for watching this episode and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Today we're going to be talking about simple past tense. We're going to talk about how to make simple past tense statements in English. So let's get started. Okay, so first let's talk about when we should use the simple past tense. Simple past tense statements for today uh, are for actions that started and ended in the past. So these are things that both started or began and ended in the past. Uh, both of those must be true to use simple past tense. The second point for today is these are actions which happened at a specific point in time. So a specific point in time can be uh, yesterday, it can be uh, an hour ago, it can be last year, it can be when you were a kid. All of these are a specific point in time. But the key is that we know when the action happened. So specific point in time is point two for this grammar point. Third, uh, we can use simple past tense for repeated actions in the past. So things you did every week or every month or every year, every summer, every hour if you like. But one point about this, make sure to include a frequency indicator if you want to talk about an action that repeated in the past. Frequency indicator, uh, for example, I just mentioned a few, every week, every month, every year. So frequency, meaning how often. An indicator shows how often you did that. So you can use repeated actions with past tense to show, uh, let's see, something you did a lot in the past, for example. So to give you a visual, uh, the past is down here, now is this point here, and future is up here. When we use the simple past tense, it's an action that started and ended in the past, somewhere before now, that's one. It's at a specific point in time. So this action and this action, we know when they happened. It could be this morning, it could be uh, yesterday, for example, but we know when these actions happened. Third, we can use for repeated action, so maybe these actions repeat, uh, but we know when the repetition happened. We know when we repeated these actions. So it's okay to use simple past tense to describe those. Okay, so now we know uh, 
when we should use simple past tense. We know why we should use simple past tense. But how do we make simple past tense statements? So, when you want to use the simple past tense to explain a, an action that happened in the past, you need to conjugate your verb. You need to change your verb. So that means when you're using a regular verb, you do verb plus ed. So verb plus ed is the basic form for simple past tense verbs. Uh, but keep in mind this is only for regular verbs. Not all verbs are regular verbs. So for example, some common ones are talk, which becomes talked, start, which becomes started, and enjoy, which becomes enjoyed. Please be careful, however. You'll notice that the past tense form of verbs has a few different pronunciations. So for example, start becomes started. It has an ID sound. It's not an ED sound, but an ID sound. You might hear a word like walked also, which has a uh, sort of T sound about it. Walk becomes walked started becomes started, an ID sound, and then there's also a sound like in breathed, a very soft D sound. So there are three past tense verb sounds to listen for, an id sound, started, a soft D sound like breathed, and then a more hard T sound like walked. So pay attention to that when you're trying to make these past tense verb conjugations. Okay, but some verbs are irregular verbs. Irregular verbs do not have a simple rule for understanding past tense conjugation, how to change them in past tense. There's no rule for these. You simply have to practice. You have to remember them, read them, listen to them, until you can remember the correct conjugation, the correct way to change these verbs into the past tense. So, for example, some common ones are eat, which becomes ate, uh, speak becomes spoke, and make becomes made. If you see a verb somewhere that, uh, that seems a little odd or you're not sure what the uh, present tense form would be, you can check a dictionary and try to remember it from there. So, uh, now we've talked about simple past tense uh, irregular and regular verbs. Let's try to use them to make some sentences. I prepared a few example sentences, so let's take a look. Okay. First sentence, he, something, something, a towel and sunglasses to the beach. So the verb here is bring. I want to use the verb bring. Bring, however, is an irregular verb. So I can't use the ED rule for regular verbs. The correct conjugation is brought. B-R-O-U-G-H-T. He brought a towel and sunglasses to the beach. This is the correct conjugation here. So bring is an irregular verb. Okay. Let's go to the next sentence. They, something, something, to the gym every day last week. So here I'm showing you a repeated action. Here I'm using every day. This is a frequency indicator. How often did I do that action? And last week shows the specific point in time. So I'm using both of these two points in addition uh, to a simple past, the basic simple past structure here. So the verb that we want to use here is go, but go is an irregular verb, so we can't use goad, for example. Go changes to went in the past tense, so went is the correct answer for this sentence here. Okay, let's try the next one. Uh, I something something to tell my boss about my schedule. Uh, so the verb I want to use here is forget. Forget is a very useful word, I think, to remember. But again, forget is not a regular verb. Forget is an irregular verb, so we cannot use the ed form. Forget in the past tense becomes forgot. Okay. So, I forgot to tell my boss about my schedule is the correct sentence here. All right, let's go to something a little bit different. Uh, here's a negative sentence. I don't think they, something, something, a reservation at the restaurant. Okay, so here I'm using a, a phrase. I want to use the phrase make a reservation, to make a reservation. So the verb here is make. This was one of my example verbs for the irregular form. So make becomes made. I don't think they made a reservation at the restaurant is the correct verb form to use here. All right, 
Uh, the next sentence, we something something junk food almost every day last month. So here, again, I have uh, every day, but I have almost here. So almost every day, not every day, but close to every day. And then last month, last month is my specific point in time in this case. So here we have junk food. That means that the verb we want to use is probably eat. And we learned that eat uh, is an irregular verb. There's no rule for conjugating this. We just know that eat becomes ate. We ate junk food almost every day last month. Great. Okay. So next sentence uh, has two spaces for verbs, actually. Okay. So the next sentence that I've prepared, I included because a lot of my students ask about how to report information. When you want to report information, uh, share something that you heard from a friend, a past tense action, you need to conjugate the reporting verb. For example, say becomes said or hear becomes heard. You need to conjugate this verb and you need to conjugate the information that you heard. So there are two past tense conjugations that should happen when you report information. Let's take a look. So here we have she something something, she something something, a great time at the party. So here, she blah blah blah, a great time at the party. Uh, so we use the expression to have a great time, to have a great time. Again, have is an irregular verb, so we conjugate it to had. She had a great time at the party. Okay. But then to report your speech, so someone uh, gave you information, past tense, give becomes gave you information. Uh, so the verb for giving information, a neutral way to pass information is say. So uh, to conjugate say into the past tense, it's an irregular verb. So we use said, say becomes said. So she said she had a great time at the party. Okay. Please be careful of your pronunciation with the word said. A lot of people I've heard use said. Said is not correct, so please use said. It sounds like S-E-D, the pronunciation, uh, but it's said. S-A-I-D is the spelling. Say becomes said. She said she had a great time at the party. Okay, so last one. Okay, so the last example sentence for today includes spaces for a few different verbs. I included this because I wanted to show you that you can use a lot of different information in one sentence just by connecting your past tense verbs together. So let's take a look. Okay, yesterday I something something late, something something shopping, and something something to my mother. Okay, so the verbs I want to use for this sentence are sleep, go, and speak. Sleep, go, and speak. These are all uh, irregular verbs. There are no regular verbs in this sentence. So, sleep in past tense becomes slept. Go in past tense becomes went. And speak in past tense becomes spoke. So here in one sentence, I have, I have explained three things about my day yesterday. Uh, yesterday, I slept late, I went shopping, and I spoke to my mother. So you can explain a lot of things with past tense and a few connecting words. In this case, I've just used and to connect the last two things in this sentence. So please keep this in mind when you're sharing information about your past events. So today we talked about the simple past tense and we talked about how to conjugate both regular and irregular verbs. It might seem a little bit difficult to understand which verbs are regular and which verbs are irregular, but with some practice it will become easier. So I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions or comments, please be sure to leave us a comment and let us know. Also, please be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Thanks very much for watching. Check us out for more at EnglishClass101.com and we'll see you again soon. Bye!